right? So first of all, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be speaking at the seminar. So I'm going to be talking about canonical height and the Andreut conjecture. And everything I talk about is joint work with uh, Jonathan Pila and Jacob Zimmerman, with an appendix by um, Elian Inno and uh, Michael Groschnik. Right, so uh, the Andreut conjecture is about Shimura varieties. So before saying anything else, let me first um, give some sort of background uh, to what Shimura varieties are. So the most basic objects that motivate the definition of Shimura varieties are complex elliptic curves and the modular curves. So um, a complex elliptic curve is just something of the form C mod lambda, where lambda contained in C is a rank uh, two lattice. Uh, lattice just means that it's a discrete subset of C, and rank two means it's a subgroup that's isomorphic abstractly to Z squared. <clears throat> so such an object, C mod lambda, is it's uh, it's clearly a group, and it's an abelian group. It's also a complex manifold, and it's a compact complex manifold. So it's a it's an abelian compact, complexly group. Not just is it a, a complex manifold, it's actually cut out by algebraic equations. Of the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, where a and b are suitable complex numbers. So given such objects, perhaps something that you might want to do is parameterize such, such objects. And in order to do that, you have to answer the following question. Given two lattices, when are the associated elliptic curves? isomorphic so the question is can you uh what 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 can you say about these two lattices so that the corresponding elliptic curves be isomorphic so it's not too hard to see that any map between elliptic curves is going to be induced just using the theory of covering spaces by a map from C to C. And as it turns out, any map little t from E1 to E2 will be induced by a capital T that's linear. And of course, you have to have that t of lambda 1 has to be contained in lambda 2. And um, the map will be an isomorphism if t of lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2. Now, any such C linear map from a one-dimensional complex vector space to itself has to be of the form scaling by some complex number. So in order to parameterize elliptic curves, <coughs> So the isomorphism, so set of isomorphism classes of complex elliptic curves are in bijection with the set of all rank two sub lattices inside the complex numbers up to scaling. So if what you want to do is um, 
find the parameterization of complex algebraic curves, well, all you have to do is classify rank two lattices inside C up to scaling. All right. So after scaling, you can assume that your rank two lattice is generated, uh, has a Z basis of the form one comma tau. So given any two basis vectors, you can always scale so that one of them becomes one. And by replacing tau by minus tau, you get the same lattice. And so you can assume that uh, tau is in the upper half plane, which is just a set of all complex numbers with positive imaginary part. All right. And given two lattices, um, lambda equals one comma tau and lambda prime equals one comma tau prime. <coughs> it ends up being just solving a system of linear equations to see that there exists some scalar alpha with alpha lambda equals lambda prime. If and only if there exists a two by two matrix in SL two Z such that your tau prime is a tau plus b over c tau plus b. So in order to see this, all you have to do is solve a bunch of linear equations. And um, well, now you see that the set of complex elliptic curves is in bijection with um, equivalence classes of elements in H where two elements are said to be equivalent if they uh, correspond to each other by a fractional linear transformation with coefficients in SL2Z. So let me spell that out a little bit more. You actually have an action of SL2R on the upper half plane, just the same action by fractional linear transformations. In fact, H has a natural metric And this action is by holomorphic isometries. And um, the set of elliptic curves, complex elliptic curves up to isomorphism <laughs> is in bijection with the portion of the upper half plane by SL2 of Z. All right. And well, you could actually draw a fundamental domain for this action and it's Gauss computed this. It looks something like that. So given all of this, let's define the complex modular curve it's called A1 of C to be H mod SL2 of Z. Now, here are some extremely uh, wonderful facts about the, about the modular curve. So a priori, this is just a complex analytic space, but just as your complex torus was, um, could be realized as the solutions to algebraic equations, let me polynomial equations, the modular curve is the set of complex points of an algebraic curve.
And in fact, <laughs> this algebraic curve, this is called A1. This algebraic curve is defined, equations defining algebraic curve actually uh, actually Q-rational. And appropriately, and if you were to interpret this appropriately, A1 is actually defined over Z. And we've seen that the complex points of um, the modular curve bijectively correspond to elliptic curves over C. The same modular interpretation holds over any ring. So up to stacky issues, so in other words, so up to uh, stacky issues, which I'm not going to address. If you're given any ring R, then the set of isomorphism classes of elliptic curves over R are in bijection with R valued points of this algebraic curve. And it makes sense to talk about R valued points of this algebraic curve because this algebraic curve is defined over Z. All right. So, um, this is a brief summary of the modular curve and the objects that it parameterizes. <laughs> Let me now briefly talk about special points on modular curves. On the modular curve. So a point on your modular curve is said to be special. If well, look at the look at the associated elliptic curve corresponding to that point. Look at its endomorphism ring. And we've already seen that your elliptic curve is, is a group, it's an abelian group. So um, any integer is going to give you a map from your elliptic curve to elliptic curve. Namely, take any point, uh, let's say y on your elliptic curve, take any number n, and just look at y plus y plus y plus y plus y n times. That tells you that um, the ring of integers is a subring of the endomorphism ring of the elliptic curve. Well, suppose the elliptic curve has more endomorphisms, then we call that elliptic curve a CN curve and we call the point parameterizing that elliptic curve special. So now, when is a point special? <laughs> and let's say complex value point, when is it going to be special? Well, there's a nice interpretation in terms of the upper half plane. So we know that there's this um, canonical map from the upper half plane to the complex points of your modular curve. In fact, we define the complex modular curve in terms of the upper half plane. So let tau be any pre-image um, of x in the upper half plane. It's going to be special if the endomorphism ring of your elliptic curve is bigger than just z. And lattice theoretically, this is going to be the case when there exists some complex number, which is not an integer, such that if you were to scale your lattice by that complex number, you end up with sub lattice of that lattice. And again, figuring this out corresponds to solving linear equations. And you see that this happens precisely when tau satisfies a quadratic equation of the form a tau squared plus b tau plus c equal to zero, where a, b, and c are integers with GCD one. And associated with this, uh, we define the discriminant of your special point to be negative d, which is b squared minus 4ac. All right. Now, it's not too hard to show, and Gauss, in fact, proved this, that there's only finitely many <laughs> special points with fixed discriminant. And well, there's 
countably many integers b, and then there's finitely many um, special points with discriminant negative d, and so there's only countably many special points. All right. Um, what else ends up being true is that if you were to take a special point and think of it as a point of the modular curve, well, it's going to have, it's actually going to, its coordinates are actually going to be contained in Q bar, not just in C. So every special point actually descends to Q bar. So these are some facts about um, special points that will be useful in defining um, special points and such like in for arbitrary similar varieties. So having talked about elliptic curves and the modular curve, let me now talk about similar varieties in generality and I'm going to define them by analogy and by using examples. <clears throat> so what were the key players in our definition of the modular curve? Well, after we set things up, we saw that an extremely important uh, role was played by the upper half plane. So the upper half plane, as I said, has a hyperbolic metric, also a complex analytic space, and um, it, it's, it's also a bounded space. So it doesn't seem very bounded, but it's actually um, biholomorphic to the open unit disk, so it is actually bounded. And the and higher dimensional generalizations of the upper half plane are so-called Hermitian symmetric domains. Well, we had this rather large Lie group that acted on H by holomorphic isometries. And analogous to this, um, there is going to the, the Lie group of there is going to be a um, Lie group of holomorphic isometries G of R that acts transitively on X. Now, having SL2R and the upper half plane wasn't enough to define the modular curve, we needed the subgroup SL2Z, or actually even finite index congruent subgroups of SL2Z are enough. And then, um, yeah, we did need this uh, so-called arithmetic subgroup SL2Z sitting inside SL2R in order to define a modular curve. And similarly, The analog of this is going to be an arithmetic subgroup sitting inside G of R, which therefore acts an X. Um, and just like in this setting, we could choose our, in, in the setting of the modular curve, we could choose our arithmetic subgroup to be the Z points of a group defined over Z. You can do similar things. And in fact, gamma will behave like the Z points of a group defined over Z. We defined our modular curve, the complex modular curve, just to be the quotient of H by SL2 of Z. And similarly, we defined the Shimura variety to be X mod gamma. At least it's um, connected components to be X mod gamma.
just like the modular curve, which a priori is a complex analytic space, is actually algebraic. And it's defined over Q. The same is also true for Shimura varieties. But now it's going to be defined over an explicitly defined extension of, of Q. And showing that um, X mod objects like X mod gamma are algebraic was done by Bailey and Burrell. And uh, it's work of Deline as well as Milne and Borovoy that tells you that your Shimura varieties actually descend to explicitly defined number fields as opposed to just being complex algebraic varieties. Um, we saw that the modular curve parameterized isomorphism classes of elliptic curves. Now, in general, <laughs> Shimura varieties aren't really um, modular spaces of varieties, but they do carry polarized variations of hot structures. They are polarized variations of hot structures. Namely, points of Ishimura variety parameterize give rise to um, hot structures. Which also, and, and as you vary along the point of Ishimura variety, this hot structure will vary in an appropriate sense. And um, the notion of special points corresponded to CM elliptic curves. And in the setting of Shimura varieties, uh, hot structures with a commutative mumford tate group. Correspond to special points. And um, in the case of the modular curve, we saw that, um, or at least I told you that special points are defined over Q bar. And actually are dense in moduli. They dense in the strongest possible sense, namely, not just are these Zariski dense, which is just the same as infinitude in the case of curves, but uh, if you were to take any complex point on your modular curve and take a small disk around it, then the set of um, CM points will be dense in the analytic topology in that disk. So in other words, special points are also analytically dense in the modular curve. And the same is going to, exactly the same is going to be true for um, arbitration model varieties. So again, special points are defined over Q bar and are dense in S. All right. So, uh, in other words, you should just be you should just be thinking of uh, Shimura varieties as high dimensional analogs of elliptic curves of of modular curves. They do look like there is going to be some object analogous to uh, the upper half plane. There's going to be some subgroup analogous to um, SL2Z and the quotient is going to be Yoshimura variety and Yoshimura variety will descend to a number field. It carries a lot of extra data, though not necessarily families of varieties. And special points are defined over Q bar and are dense in Yoshimura variety. So before talking about the distribution of um, special points, let me just give you some examples of Shimura varieties. So you have sort of a picture to have in your head that goes beyond just a modular curve. <clears throat> so, well, we saw that uh, the moduli space of elliptic curves is a modular curve and, and a Shimura variety. Now, the high dimensional generalizations of an elliptic curve uh, are abelian varieties, and the moduli space of g dimensional 
polarized abelian varieties. Let's call this AG. <coughs> AG Shimura variety. And just like the modular curve was defined by the group SL2 or GL2, AG is defined by the symplectic group on a two-dimensional vector space. And similar to the case of elliptic curve, special points are in bijection with CM abelian varieties. Then um, if, you, if you were to take an orthogonal group, with an appropriate real signature, you get a Shimura variety that parameterizes polarized K3 surfaces. Um, special points should be thought of Shimura varieties in their own right. In fact, they are zero-dimensional Shimura varieties. Strictly speaking, connected components of zero-dimensional Shimura varieties. Uh, they are associated to tori. And special points, as I said earlier, are all defined over Q bar. Now, Shimura varieties don't just live in isolation, they actually map to each other. In a very precise sense, whenever you look at groups defining Shimura varieties, and you've got maps between these groups that's uh, in an appropriate sense, then uh, the associated Shimura varieties will also map to each other. And whenever your Shimura variety has a modular interpretation, these maps also agree with this modular interpretation. So for instance, um, if you were to look at A1, the modularized space of elliptic curves, the modular curve, and if you were to look at A2, the modularized space of abelian surfaces, is a natural map from A1 to A2 induced by maps between the groups defining A1 and the group defining A2. And this map has a very natural modular interpretation. So if you were to take a point in A1, that's going to correspond to an elliptic curve. Well, given an elliptic curve, how do you get a two-dimensional abelian variety? You just look at the elliptic curve cross itself. This is an abelian surface, it's two-dimensional abelian variety. Let's say it corresponds to the point Y in A2, well, then just map the point X to the point Y. And such a map is actually defined in terms of uh, the groups defining A1 and A2. And as is clear in this example, namely, if you were to take a CM elliptic curve, then E cross E will be a CM abelian surface. Whenever you have a map between Shimura varieties, you always get that special points map to special points. And finally, let me say that while many, in fact, maybe even most Shimura varieties have modular interpretations in terms of abelian varieties, not all Shimura varieties carry families of varieties. So not all of them have known modular interpretations. And those that don't are called exceptional Shimura varieties. Largely because many Shimura varieties that don't have modular interpretations are defined by exceptional groups, not classical groups. And those that do 
are said to be of abelian type. Because roughly speaking, they parameterize abelian varieties, though uh, there's a small caveat to that statement as well. All right. So let me talk a bit about uh, the distribution of special points, which is basically the anterior conjecture. So here's a question that um, Oat and Andre, Andre and Oat, they, they posed. So the question is, what sub-varieties of Ishimura variety S have a Zarsky dense set of special points. Well, first of all, S itself, because I've already told you that special points are dense in the ambient Shimura variety. Now, um, if you were to take any Shimura variety and map it to a different Shimura variety. We've seen that special points map to special points. And because special points <laughs> of S1 are dense in S1 and special points map to special points, the image of S1 also has a Zariski dense set of special points. And getting the technical here, but then um, irreducible components of Hecke translates of images of such maps also have a Zalski dense set of special points, and um, we'll define all such sub-varieties a special sub-variety. Just for the purpose of intuition, just think of, just think of this case. So these are sub-varieties that obviously have a dense of special points. And the conjecture of Andre note is that these are the only ones. So let Z contained in S have a sub-variety having a dense set of special points. Then Z is a special sub-variety. And there's been a massive amount of past work some of which, and this is an extremely non-exhaustive list, but <clears throat> some of which includes work of Andre who proved <laughs> the Andre conjecture for um, a product of two modular curves, and Eric Sobin, who proved it for a product of arbitrarily many modular curves, but um, contingent on the Riemann hypothesis. Then Klingler, in joint work with, um, I think, Ulmo and Yafayev, proved the Andre conjecture in full generality, but assuming the um, Riemann hypothesis. Then Pila and Zimmerman both have a lot of past work on the anterior conjecture. And of course, there's a lot of other people who think about this. Let me just um, say a little bit about the case of AG. Uh, sorry. Yes. 
you mean the, that is the closure of Z or in the statement of conduct? Oh, sorry. So um, Z is a subvariety. Oh, you mean? Z subvariety that contains a Zalski dense set of special points. Then we say that, that uh, then the conjecture is that there is itself a special. Oh, so you can also say that uh, the Zariski closure of it, if you, uh, if that is also a dense set of special points. Absolutely, absolutely. An equivalent formulation is exactly what you said. You could just start off with any set of special points inside the Shimura variety, take the Zariski closure, and then the conjecture would be that um, that is a special subvariety or a finite union of special subvarieties. That's exactly right. <laughs> yes, yes so thank you. The equivalent. Zalski closure of special points is a special subvariety. So let's just say special. <laughs> so um, uh, Jacob proved the Andreot conjecture for AG and therefore as well as well as any Shimura variety of abelian type. And he proved it by using, by crucially using work of uh, Masser and Zanier on isogeny estimates, uh, or on like isogeny, uh, the beautiful theorem on isogenies and uh, the faulting side of same abelian varieties. And so using this, uh, using their beautiful work in a very crucial way, Jacob proved that it suffices to uh, prove that CM abelian varieties have small height, small in a quantifiable sense that I won't get into, and then used the average version of Kolmes conjecture, of Kolmes's conjecture, which is which was proved by um, Andriada, Goren, Howard, and Mother Pussy, as well as by Yuan and Zhang, to prove that uh, these height bounds actually hold. Oh yes, and I should say that um, another crucial ingredient in all of this is the Pilazania method. All right. So well, there are still some uh, there are still some Shimura varieties that are not abelian type. Namely, the exceptional ones, and there wasn't it. There was no theory of, of uh, isogenies and heights for isogenies, analogous to the beautiful theorem proof of Massa and Zani. Um, however, <laughs> Binyamini Schmidt and Yafayev building on prior work of Binyamini, prove the following theorem. So let S be a Shimura variety associated to an adjoint group, an adjoint reductive group. In fact, an adjoint semi-simple group, G. And let uh, T be a rational torus mapping to G in a way that's compatible with uh, Shimura structure. So suppose this induces a map ST to our Shimura variety, where ST is a zero-dimensional Shimura variety associated with the torus T. Uh, 
Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I I should have said this was Massa Wusholz, Massa Wusholz isosceles theorem. Apologies. Thanks for the comment. All right. Well, so given Ishimura variety associated with an adjoint group G, and if you have um, a special point induced by a map from a torus T to G, then suppose you can prove that for a way height on Ishimura variety, the height of your special point is small, similar to um, small in a similar sense as in this case. then the unzeroed conjecture is true. And what we prove is that special points as above in adjoint Shimura varieties, in fact, an adjoint exceptional Shimura varieties, have bounded height. And so the anterior conjecture follows. All right, so let me uh, now, the last uh, seven or 10 minutes, dive into our strategy. <clears throat> so let G be an adjoint group. And let it, and suppose it induces the Shimura variety. It's called S. Now, <coughs> uh, let V be a G representation defined over Q. So then what we do is that we define a height on S using this data, but we define it in the following way. Suppose you have Or rather, our definition needs uh, our definition has a following crucial um, consequence. Now, suppose you have a sub Shimura variety of your Shimura variety induced by a map of reductive groups G prime to G. Now, given this, um, V is also going to be a representation of G prime, just because G prime maps to G. And so you get a height on S. So our definition gives us a height on S prime as well. So then the height on S prime is compatible with the height on S. In other words, you could just ignore the fact that S existed. G, uh, v is a representation of G prime, so our construction gives a height on S prime. But on the other hand, now if you remember the fact that S prime maps to S and we have a height on S, that induces a height on S prime, the two different heights are compatible with each other. That's what our construction gives us. Then this height is well-defined. whenever G is GSP. So you don't necessarily need a group to be adjoint. It also covers other cases. In fact, it covers the case of for any uh, Shimura variety of abelian type.
And in the case of GSP, it is agrees with the faulting side. And finally, right, so what this means is we've defined a height that behaves well after pullback and that agrees with the faulting site on GSP. And finally, um, <clears throat> heights on special points in the original Shimura variety S can be reduced <clears throat> to heights on so-called partial CM types. And Delin has a beautiful trick in his second paper on Shimura varieties. <coughs> reduces um, bounding heights on partial CM types. To, to bounding heights on same abelian varieties. But this is already done. Using the average Colmes conjecture. While proving the average conjecture for AG. So this is the broad outline of, um, of what we do. Now what I'll do is I'll briefly describe how um, we define these heights, and then I'll end my talk with that. <coughs> so let G, S, and V B as above. So work of Berlin and Milne associates to this data. A lot of associates to this, a lot of data on Ishimura variety. First of all, for every prime L, you get an eta local system on Ishimura variety. That descends to the that depends to the number field of definition of Ishimura variety. And using the classical Riemann Hilbert correspondence, you also get a vector bundle with connection, which is filtered and that satisfies Griffith transversality. And all of this also descends to the number field. And we'll define our height by metrizing uh, the determinants of graded pieces of this vector bundle with connection, of this filter vector, vector bundle with connection. Now, <laughs> because everything is defined over a number field and everything is algebraic, all of this data not, not necessarily the local systems, but the data of the vector bundle connection and the Shimura variety will spread out over the ring of integers with some large enough number inverted. Now, um, the periodic Riemann Hilbert correspondence. Uh, by Liu and Zhu and by Diao Lan, Liu Zhu in the logarithmic case, gives you a way of starting off just with this uh, periodic guitar local system defined over Q, defined over a um, uh, uh, over a non-Archimedean local field. And it spits out so it starts off with this data and it spits out a vector bundle with connection 
<coughs> defined over the base change Krishna Mura variety to your local field. And they prove that um, the PRD Freeman Hilbert correspondence applied to your local system is actually canonically isomorphic, and the canonicity is important to the vector bundle of connection base changed to EP. To this vector bundle of connection base changed to EP. So they prove a compatibility of their PRD Freeman Hilbert correspondence with the normal PRD Freeman Hilbert correspondence. Sorry, the normal Riemann Hilbert correspondence, the complex one. So we use this PRD Freeman Hilbert correspondence and this construction to metrize the graded pieces of our vector bundle with connection. And because um, our construction is PRD Hodge theoretic and this Riemann Hilbert correspondence behaves well under restriction, our metrics behave well under pullback. And so at special points, everything is compatible with the faulting side. And when I say compatible with the faulting side, I mean like once you run, run through Delin's trick, you can get compatibility with the faulting side. <clears throat> And in fact, if you were to run this just for AG, then it's going to be compatible with the faulting side. Now, this gives you extremely, this gives you very nice PRIC metrics at every, at every place P, but the problem is that the PRIC metrics might not, might not glue well across across various different prime P to give a well-defined global height. And in fact, what we want is ideally we'd want this metric to agree with the metric defined by the spread out integral model for large enough prime p. Well, we uh, there seems to be no way to prove that. So the fix was to use work of Eno and Groznik, which they generalized in uh, our appendix, where they show that because our Shimura variety satisfy Margulis super rigidity, implies then a consequence of that is that for large enough times p, the Piadic local systems that we have on Yoshimura variety base change to EP are actually crystalline in the Piadic Hodge theoretic sense, in the Piadic Hodge theoretic sense, uh, following faultings, Fontaine, and LFI. <laughs> and they also prove that uh, if you were to apply the faultings Fontaine LFI correspondence, if you apply it to this uh, integral periodic local system, then you actually get the integral vector, the integral spread vector bundle with connection for large enough times p. So then what we do is for small p, we use the periodic Riemann Hilbert correspondence to define a matrix. For large primes P uh, for, and large is in terms of the ambient Shimura variety, we use a crystallinity to define the metric using the integral vector bundle with connection. And the fact that we have crystallinity tells you that things behave well under restriction. That's exactly why we need crystallinity because like um, periodic Hodge theoretic operations behave well under restriction. Otherwise, there's no reason that uh, if you were to take a random integral model of your vector bundle with connection, there's no reason that that 
the metric defined by that should give you um, a nice, should, should, should behave well when restricted to such number of varieties. And uh, there's like a little more subtlety that happens while comparing these two metrics, but let me not go into that. Uh, let me just start by saying that once we have heights defined in this way, we can then um, use Delian strict to establish the height bounds on our same points using height bounds on CM abelian varieties. So let me stop here. Uh, thanks very much for your attention.